Hey y'all, I'm Allie Spears, and this is Ag Chicks, where we dig deep with the women who are helping to feed the world. All right, I am excited. I mean, I, I always say that. I feel like I say I'm excited every time I hit record when I start these, but I am excited to have Kaya join me today. Um, Kaya and I met at the Rural, I always say this, Rural Rooted Reunion. Um, this is definitely a mouthful. Uh, back in January in Nashville, and she was our group leader, I guess you could say, for our little breakout group. Um, and she's definitely one of those people that you meet her and you feel like you've known her forever and you feel like you're going to have a good time. And that is exactly what happened. Um, so Kaya, I'm so excited to have you on today. Can you get us started by telling everyone a little bit about who you are? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's such an honor to be on the show. And actually, Allie, I think the first time we actually met in person was at NFR. You and your mom had a booth oh, there. Yes. And I was like, she looks so familiar. And then I realized that it was because we were going to be at the Rural Rooted, which is a mouthful, um, together. So uh, I just love all the random connections. You know, you never know when you're going to stumble upon someone. So. <laughs> Yes, that's right. I totally forgot about that. That is exactly the first time we met. But we Did became all- friends, I would say, in January. So yes. it totally yes. counts. Um, yeah, so I am, I like to say that I am a California cattle rancher, accidentally turned life coach and speaker and podcaster. And in, in a really roundabout way, um, kind of became involved in the agriculture industry. I was born into in an entirely different way now. So long story short, you know, I started my career in agriculture communications, working on behalf of the Kentucky Beef Council, really found this place for me in agriculture, being the bridge between um, producers and consumers. I love agriculture. My biggest passion is undoubtedly for people. And while I was there, I started this health journey um, and just started sharing about it more online, openly about what I was learning and the different skills and tools and mindset that I was fostering. And it really, really resonated with people. And thanks to some really incredible media exposure, the summer of 2020 in People Magazine, Good Morning America, Access Hollywood, Um, I really established this platform that allowed me to lean into a different career path, which was life coaching. And since then, I've been building my coaching business, um, had the opportunity to speak on stages all across the country. And now I kind of find my place in agriculture being not in the production that I grew up in, not solely in the communications that I started my career in, but really in this way of helping empower the women in agriculture to love themselves deeper, care for themselves better, and find joy in this messy, beautiful journey of life. I think that's the backbone of what I do. And I also work with people outside of ag, of course, as well. And most recently, um, the latest project I've been working on um, with my girlfriend, Courtney Dehoff, is the Backroad Cowgirls Adventure, where we tell stories of people in agriculture. So lots of projects up in the air, but um, that kind of gives you a roundabout summary of, of who I am and where I'm at today. Yes. And uh, I feel like I can relate to you on the realm of having lots of things, lots of irons in the fire. Um, I feel like sometimes I never know which direction I'm going and don't know what the day is going to bring. And I feel like you can definitely relate to that in terms of all of the things you have going on right now. Oh gosh. I feel that deep in my bones. My poor husband, he can't keep up with me. He doesn't know what I'm doing from one day to the next. Cause I don't know what I'm doing from one day to the next, but I got to trust that all these little passions that we're interested in Allie are all going to add up and line up to make beautiful sense one day. So <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I think that even though sometimes these things feel very unconnected, I think that they are deeply connected in maybe ways that we just are not sure of yet. I absolutely agree. You know, I recently did an episode on my podcast about, um, this quest for joy and giving myself permission to lean into these things that seem random or disconnected because if they bring me joy and I'm the thing that connects them at this phase in my life, I think that they're worthwhile and kind of trusting that those passions are going to bring them to fruition in a way that will, I kind of describe them as like, I feel like all these different balls I'm juggling in the air, the projects I'm working on feel like puzzle pieces. And right now they're kind of like mix match, not quite setting into place, but I feel like eventually all the puzzle pieces are going to kind of like click into place. Um, But for now, I'm just kind of exploring and trying different things and following the things that bring me joy. I hear you. Okay. So I do want to kind of start back at the beginning here. So young Kaya, what was she like, what was her dream job? What was what you were going to do with your life? 
Ooh, I love this question. When I was growing up, my, you know, I grew up very rural California, had to drive an hour to go to the nearest gas station, grocery store, like middle of nowhere or middle of everywhere, depending on your perspective. (laughs) But when I was little, I used to tell myself and everybody that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted so badly to be a teacher. My mom was a teacher at our rural elementary school. And I used to force my little cousins into playing school. All they wanted to play was recess. And I would force them (laughs) to learn with me before they got to play. And that was my dream career all the way up through, I'd say probably middle of high school. And then I got in an RTV accident that um, I broke most of the bones in my right ankle. I was in the hospital for eight days straight. And I remember the impact that the nurses had on me while I was there. And I thought to myself, man, you know, I felt so cared for by these, by these women that were supporting me. And I think it'd be so cool to, to give that feeling back to someone one day. So kind of middle of middle of high school, I was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe to heck with teaching, maybe I'll go into nursing or the medical route. And then I went to college and I took a chemistry class (laughs) and that dream quickly shifted to not be something medical. I realized that, you know what, science, chemistry, biology, maybe not where I flourish. Um, and so I, I kind of was in this weird mid, messy middle in high school, or sorry, in college where I wasn't quite sure my degree was actually human development with a minor in education, which is ironic now because it's kind of exactly what I'm doing with life coaching. And it actually became a degree that I was going to use, but in the middle of college, I still wasn't quite sure. I was really involved in a lot of ag organizations. And while I didn't think I was going to go into an agriculture career, I could feel it pulling me back in because my heart was just there. And so that's kind of where I ended up in communications. Like, okay, maybe I'm not the sciencey person. Maybe I'm not the producer, but maybe I can be this voice and this connection point. And now, you know, it's interesting thinking about my desire to be a teacher growing up because now I kind of do get to be a teacher, but just in this life coaching way, this non-traditional way, which I think is so funny, you know, hindsight's always 2020. And so while what I do now kind of seems disconnected to what I thought I used to do, I think every phase of my life has kind of fallen into this really beautiful career that I would have never guessed or didn't even know existed if you would have told me in high school. Yeah. As soon as you said teacher, I was like, oh, well, she is a teacher. I mean, that is basically kind of a role that you're taking on. Um, So again, kind of going back to our little conversation before about how all of this is connected, even if we are not sure how in the greener um, scheme of things. So uh, how cool that that kind of has come back full circle, really, in a weird way. Yeah, it has in a weird way. And it makes me so curious to thinking about you know, if you would have told me five years ago, 10 years ago, where I'd be now, and maybe you can relate to this too, Allie, I would have never imagined. And I have a lot of, I, I'm an Enneagram three. So I'm a, I'm a future focused person. I have a lot of big dreams for the future, but I think to myself, sometimes I bet in five years, I'm going to be doing something that I didn't even know existed based on where I think I might be now, which is just so kind of interesting and exciting to think about. Yes, I can totally relate to that. Uh, if you would have told me even three years ago, I would have been hosting a podcast and now on season three of it, I would have said, I don't even really like talking to people. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, absolutely yeah. not. but now I've totally found this passion for it and it's allowed for so many other doors and opportunities. And I've actually figured out, I do like talking to people and I do like sharing stories and all of those things that were just not in my things of thought of thought or what I really thought I was going to end up doing. So very crazy how life puts you in places and gives you people that kind of guide you in a direction that you're not expecting sometimes. Oh, totally, totally. And so much growth that happens along the way for sure. Absolutely. And so kind of speaking along the lines of growth and everything. So for you, you were very much involved in the agriculture communication side of things. And then this whole life coach thing kind of transformed. Um, And can you maybe talk about how that transition happened? Yeah. So I, my first, I call it, I say my first big kid job out of college was working for the Kentucky beef council. So after I graduated from UC Davis, I actually moved to Germany for a year for a cultural ambassadorship exchange program. And while I was abroad, I was applying for jobs and I saw this job posted on LinkedIn and um, it was for the beef council in Kentucky. And I'd never been to Kentucky before. 
And it's so funny to think about now because I did my, it was a Skype interview then before Zoom was a thing. And I was a Californian living in Europe. I had a nose ring and they were talking to me over the internet and my soon to be boss, Dave, just thinking about how he, that probably would have blown his mind. I found out later that I almost didn't get the job. I was like one vote away from not getting the job. Cause they just thought, I don't know. She's a wild card. I don't know if she's going to fit in here, but um, they ended up giving me the job and I came back home from Germany for a couple of weeks for my county fair. And then I moved across the country to Kentucky. And in that role as the director of consumer affairs, I loved it because my job was really to represent Kentucky's 38,000 plus cattle farmers. They're not farmers or sorry, they're not ranchers over there. They're farmers, which was a hard habit to break because in the West, we're all ranchers yeah. and it was just so cool because I got to, um, you know, do cooking demonstrations. I got to do our, our recipe demos on the morning news show and um, put together advertising campaigns and work with influencers and nutrition professionals. And it was so rewarding. And I learned so much in that in that job that has really translated extremely well to what I do today, which also could be a little unexpected. But one of the programs I was in charge of was our nutrition program. And so it was my job to help communicate the nutritional benefits of beef to different stakeholders like registered dietitians, teachers, parents, just general consumers. And while I believed wholeheartedly in the information and the research and the recipes that I was sharing on behalf of the beef checkoff, I felt really conflicted in that role. Number one, because I didn't have a degree. I wasn't a registered dietitian. I had no credentials or fancy letters after my name to qualify me to be the expert. But two, if someone were to look at me, I didn't exactly look like the vision of health. I didn't look like someone who walked the talk. And it left me feeling so conflicted in that role of thinking, gosh, am I doing more of a disservice for the industry that I love so much mm. because I'm not maybe being the best example of the messages I'm sharing than I am actually helping it. And it just, I felt I felt out of alignment. I felt out of integrity in that role. And I was getting ready to leave for this Ag Media Summit conference from Kentucky to Arizona. And when I um, was at the bookstore, I happened to buy at the airport bookstore, this book that people on social media I saw talking about everywhere. It was Rachel Hollis's book, Girl, Wash Your Face. And at the time I was someone who bought a lot of books, but I didn't read them. <laughs> Maybe somebody listening can relate. Okay. You know, I had this like, stack of books on my bedside table to make it look like I was real, well read, but um, they just collected dust for the most part. So I buy this book thinking, okay, maybe I'll read this. And um, we, I get on the, I get on the plane and I go to buckle my seatbelt and it doesn't fit. And this was the first time that my seatbelt didn't fit. And I had to ask for a seatbelt extender. And at that moment, sitting on that packed airplane surrounded by my coworkers, I just felt like my face turned bright red with shame and embarrassment. And the only thing I could do not to burst into tears was to shove my face in that freaking book. And in that one four hour plane ride, I devoured it front to back. And there was one thing that really jumped out at me. You know, most of the things that I was reading, I'd heard them before, but it was like, it was the right time. It was the right message at the right time at a moment when I was finally ready to receive it. You know, I think all of us can probably relate to our mom or someone at some point giving us advice and us being like, whatever, mom, no big deal. And then later on, we're like, wow, that was really great advice because you, you know, someone can give you great advice, but if you're not ready to receive it, it's not going to hit you. But it, this hit me. And the message that really hit me that day was the conversation of ownership. And it was this idea that if it was my choices that got me here, which at the time was a place where I was feeling unhealthy and happy with myself. I was feeling, you know, I liked my job, but I was feeling unfulfilled. Like I wanted something more. If it was my choices that got me here, then it gets to be my choices that get me somewhere else. And at first it was this like hard pill to swallow. Like, oh my gosh, it's my fault. It's my choices that made me feel this way, unhappy, unhealthy, unfulfilled. But at the same time, it was the most freeing realization of like, wait, but it can be my choices to get me somewhere else. And I realized I'd been playing victim in my life in a big way, thinking, well, I can never get healthy because my genetics, or I don't get paid enough by my job to afford fancy, you know, workout equipment or a fancy gym membership, or my job's too demanding and I don't have the time. I was really giving all my power to everyone outside of me instead of saying, wait a second, what can I do? What choices can I make? What actions can I choose? What mindset can I foster in order to get where I want to go? And that was my wake up call. And that fall, October 1st, I started, it's what I call my day one of my health journey. 
I started waking up earlier, um, started writing gratitude in a gratitude journal, moving my body in my living room with free YouTube dance workouts. Um, and I woke up an hour earlier every single day to start working on this side business. I knew I wanted to have the freedom and flexibility one day to work for myself. And so I started with these small baby steps. Fast forward three months, I had already lost 25 pounds, had established a side business and fast forward one year, I ended up losing over a hundred pounds in one year. And I blew my own mind. And it really, really all started with, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how did you, like, what did you eat? How did you move your body? And while yes, diet and, you know, and exercise is important. The number one thing that I did was transform my mind and my mindset. And I think that's really the root of any transformation, whether it's a physical health transformation, whether it's a career transformation, whether it's any transformation in life, I really think it all comes down to our mindset. And that's where my journey really began. Yeah, I could not agree more, really. And I think mental health and all of that was something we, not that we didn't, I didn't talk about growing up, but it was just something that wasn't like a routine conversation, maybe more so as it is now. And as I'm getting older and having all of these different experiences, it really is such an important piece to being healthy, not only in body, but also in mind and spirit. And so the way you have gone about kind of expressing that and sharing that, I think is such a unique way that is not being done necessarily. Um, you know, you maybe see all these fitness influencers who are showing you how to work out and how to eat, which is great. But the very important piece that's missing to all of that is the mind. And if you're not able to make that shift in your mind, then you can do X, Y, and Z. But when you wake up one day and the motivation's not there, then, you know, then how do you proceed forward? Um, and so I think also because of the space that you come from being in agriculture, where sometimes it's isolating and you don't maybe have access to the gym or things like that. It's a refreshing way for people to understand like, Hey, you know, I can do this too. And I can, if I can change my mindset, who knows what else can come from that. So I commend you on doing that and also sharing because as someone who shares on social media, it is not always easy to put yourself out there, especially in vulnerable ways when you're talking about mental health and uh, health in terms of nutrition and exercise and all that stuff. So um, I appreciate you sharing your story as well. Well, thank you, Ali. You know, I, I'm totally with you. You know, I think I grew up in a family where mental health wasn't talked about. It just First of all, I think it's a culture we come from in agriculture, but it just, it wasn't a hot topic conversation like it is now right. just in general. And, and I think that growing up, I thought if I want to change my life, I have to change what I do. It was so action focused, right. Right. which is why starting from age 10, I would diet thinking, okay, the problem is my body. What do I need to do to change it? Instead of recognizing, wait, the root of this is not, it's not a food problem. It's not an exercise problem. I know how to eat healthy. I know how to move my body. The root of this is that I use food to numb the, the shame that I feel about myself and my body. Mm -hmm. The answer isn't changing my body first. The answer is learning how to make peace, love, and respect my body as it is like really that mental health before focusing on the action. And I think that we just grew up in a society, especially around, you know, and this, this is connected to all sorts of things, but especially around, um, physical health and well-being, right? We're taught to think about our, bo our bodies as the problem to be solved. And if you want to solve this problem, just do this, eat this, do this workout and everything will be, be, be better instead of learning like, okay, my body is not a problem. First of all, my body is a gift. I can appreciate it at the weight that it is now. If it doesn't change, I can still find gratitude for how it is before I focus on how to change it. Cause I realize that all those actions, if your actions are fueled from this place of shame and judgment, no amount of change is going to make that shame and judgment go, in, go away. Mm -hmm. Instead it's learning like, how can I love and appreciate myself as I am? And from that place of love and appreciation, then show up and take these actions because I love myself, not because I think I need to change my body in order to love myself. And that's so huge, but yeah, it's been a wild journey and, um, sharing on social media can be hard. It can be exhausting for sure, but I feel really hopeful about, um, the way that the conversations are changing across the board. And, um, I think being able to do this work on yourself first, 
and then being able to share that with the world, whatever that work is that you're doing, I think is so powerful. I think the way we change the world is by first healing our relationships with ourselves. And I feel like that's one piece that I can contribute. If I can help one other woman learn how to love herself a little bit better then my job is done. Yes. I think that's, and that's, I mean, in difference, but similar lines, that's kind of how I started ag chicks was I had a question and a problem I was internally dealing with. And so I was like, well, maybe if I talk to other people, I'll figure this out. Um, which was extremely helpful just from a personal level, but then yeah. all these other people were coming to me and saying like, oh my gosh, like I had no idea that this, this, and this were involved in agriculture, or I could totally yeah. relate to this person. And so, um, the, the space of sharing and because it's so available in the society that we mm-hmm. live in through social mm-hmm. media, podcasts, all of this, YouTube, all those types of things. Um, it creates for a unique opportunity and experience and speaking about mm-hmm. sharing. So you, your story was picked up by people magazine, correct? Mm-hmm. And then you were on the Kelly Clarkson show. So let's talk about that real quick. Cause how yeah. freaking cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was wild. So, you know, it's, it's kind of funny coming back to where we started the beginning of the conversation, Allie, about how all these different things in our lives, they seem unrelated, but they all come back together. So the way that I came into life coaching really ties back to my beef career. So as I was sharing more about my personal health journey on social media, you know, I had these great relationships with people that worked in the beef industry all across the country. And I had the beef it's what's for dinner team, um, reach out to me and say, Hey, Kaya, you know, we love your story. We think it's incredible. This health transformation you've gone through, you still eat beef. You happen to also be media trained because you worked for the beef checkoff for a few years. Do you mind if we pitch your story? And I thought, yeah, of course, feel free to pitch my story. And at the time I didn't know where they were pitching it to, but they pitched my story to people magazine for their summer of 2020 transformations issue. And they picked it up and then people magazine, they, you know, want to promote their issue. So they, they pitched my story to good morning America. And then it was on access Hollywood. It was in women's health. Um, and it got translated into languages all around the world. And that story that summer reached over 1.5 billion people, which is so hard to wrap my mind around. And I will say, I think one of the reasons it did that is because let's be honest before and after pictures are sexy clickbait. People love before and after pictures. And so it's also interesting to see how my story got you know, construed differently through every different media that picked it up. But um, it was still really cool to be able to connect with women and people all around the world that had similar stories or could really resonate with mine, especially talking about mindset. And this last year, 2021, Beef It's What's For Dinner reached out to me again. They said, hey, we have another story we'd love to pitch you to. Um, It's the Kelly Clarkson show. And I was like, oh my gosh. They said they were doing this this segment on um, second chances. And so they had me send in a little video, um, talking about my story. And in March of 2021, I got to go down to the studio, which was so exciting because all the people magazine stuff was really great, but it was in the heart of COVID. So everything was via zoom, but I actually got to go down to the studio at universal studios in Hollywood and go on to set to be on the Kelly Clarkson show. And it was the most incredible experience. I felt like a movie star. I had my own dressing room. I got to do hair and makeup. I made best friends with them. They were so fascinating, such cool people. And I got to sit down on a couch across from Kelly Clarkson. And it was so cool. But the craziest part of it all, Allie, was as as I'm sitting there talking to Kelly, she's asking me about my story and what kind of sparked sparked this, this transformation. And I shared with her about that book, the book that I read on the plane. And she said, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. She's like, well, you know, there's actually someone here that wants to meet you. And then the backstage doors open up and Rachel Hollis, the author of that book jumps from behind the stage and comes out and they surprised me live on the Kelly Clarkson show with Rachel Hollis, the woman whose book was really this catalyst for my whole transformation. And I lost my mind. Mind you, I had to be briefed beforehand that I wasn't allowed to hug anybody because it was, you know, height of COVID. And so I'm sitting there, standing there, like jumping up and down, air hugging Rachel Hollis from across the couch. And it was so, it was so cool. The coolest full circle moment. And on the show, she invited me to come to her women's conference. Um, that was going to happen later that summer. And when I met her backstage, you know, we were just talking, um, and she was so lovely. And she said, wait a second, 
what if instead of you just coming to the show, why don't you be a keynote speaker? And I had that moment of disbelief. And after the show happened and I went back home, I thought she's going to forget. It's probably not going to happen. Like it won't, I won't actually be able to speak on her stage, but in summer, in uh, September of 2021, I got to fly to Austin, Texas and be a keynote speaker at her rise conference, which was just incredible. You know, thinking about the whole, like, okay, three years ago, what would you have imagined? If you would have told me three years before that, that not only was I going to lose the weight, learn to love my body, establish a healthy habit, but be on national media and speak on the rise stage. I would have thought you were a big fat liar. Like it just, it was such an incredible experience. And, um, I will say, you know, it's so easy to see these big, exciting things and also miss the parts of it that maybe aren't as exciting or like, so one little thing about the Rachel Hollis and and Kelly Clarkson show experience was, um, I was actually supposed to go and speak at her conference the weekend after my wedding in May. And the week that the Kelly Clarkson show aired, Rachel Hollis happened to post this video on social media. It was this like rant video and it blew up in a really bad way on her, on social media. And I happened to be the post right before it. And it was my first taste of really getting to witness somebody that I really respected, um, make a, a mistake on a really large platform. And, um, people came for her. People came for me because I was, you know, all of a sudden associated with this woman. Right. And I don't think that what she said came from a place of actual, like she didn't want to actually, you know, share any hate or disrespect. I just think it's, she said something without thinking it through. Mm-hmm. And, um, she happened to lose a hundred thousand followers, like overnight, mm-hmm. they postponed the conference. And I thought oh, it's never going to happen but they ended up rescheduling it to September and it ended up being really, really great. But I got to, I got to tell you guys, you know, um, that incident made me a little bit afraid of success. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense, it made me so nervous of like, Oh my gosh, you know, the more successful you get, the more public your mistakes are. And that can be scary and learning how to like coach myself through that, like giving myself permission to be like, Hey, Kaya, you know what? One day you might make a mistake too. Actually, you will make a mistake too. And people aren't going to like it. And the more people that are, are following you or engaging with you, um, the more eyes are going to be on that mistake and like, kind of just recognizing that that's a part of the journey. Um, but yeah, it was, it was an interesting learning opportunity for me for sure. Well, I'm glad you kind of said that actually, because I think in the world that we live in, everyone thinks, oh, the more followers I have, the more engagement I have, the better things will be. That's how I'm measuring my success. But like you just said, that's not always a good thing because if you make one little mistake, which we're human, right? It's going to happen. There's so much more exposure than just, you know, a tiny little thing on, on social media when you don't have as many followers or whatever it may be. Um, But I think that's a good thing to remember for those who are maybe sharing on social media or wanting to be a part of like this successful thing that is now being Mm -hmm. measured is that there's a lot of scrutiny that comes with it, Mm -hmm. especially I think in agriculture, because of the controversial issues that we are sometimes sharing about, um, it's, it's getting to be a little touchy. And so you have to be prepared for that. If you're going to step into that space. It totally can. And, and I think too, that this is a a beautiful reminder too, that if you feel like you're someone who, man, I wish I had more followers or I wish I I had more clients. I wish I was bigger or better, whatever that is. I, I want people to feel really empowered at the value of starting small and like, don't rush the process because being able to make mistakes and learn and fail and grow with a small community is such a gift that is, is so much easier to do before you have that, that, you know, big success or big, big followers for sure. You know, my platform, I was sharing for about, um, about a year before it kind of blew up thanks to that big media exposure. And I'm so grateful for that because, um, had I had big media exposure and got 17,000 followers overnight, like it happened before I had already learned how to like craft a message. And I'm not perfect. Lord knows I still am learning alongside people, but you know, if you feel like, man, I only have a few hundred followers or, um, a few thousand followers, like that's great keep showing up, keep learning, like really foster that engagement and that community. Um, instead of worrying about getting more followers, I heard Jenna Kutcher share one time that she said, when you are so focused on getting other followers, it's like having hosting a party at your house 
having a room full of people, but standing outside, just trying to get more people to come into the party. And instead she said, so you have 10 followers. So you have a hundred followers. Like that's 10 people or a hundred people in your house, Mm -hmm. like serve them really, really well. And when you serve them really, really well, that's, what's going to get people more in the door. And I think we forget that sometimes we get so focused on growth and engagement and numbers. And I think that it sometimes distracts us from the point, which is serving people well. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And, um, like you said, I mean, it, it's easy to get caught up in that, right? Like, oh, I need more. I need more. Totally. But if you can foster the relationships that you have in the space that you have, I think it makes for the longevity to be a lot more successful in the end, um, as well. So kind of actually going right back to you being the keynote speaker at that conference, was that kind of like your launching pad into the speaking atmosphere of things? Yeah. So I had already had some public speaking experience, you know, I mean, I guess you could say that it started in 4-H and FFA, like probably many of your followers or your listeners. Um, And I had a lot of experience too, with public speaking at the beef council, having to speak at conferences and do a lot of media on TV and radio. And so I was really grateful to already have built my public speaking skills. And I had done a few um, women's conferences, but I wasn't really pitching myself as a speaker, especially not a paid speaker, especially not for a lot of money. Um, I think my first paid um, speaking gig was January of 2020 at a women's conference in Kentucky. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what I was supposed to charge, you know, really learning as I went. But I will say that speaking at the Rise Conference really helped me establish a platform and some credibility. I mean, it really helps too, to have a really great video of you speaking on stage. And I felt like so fancy up there, Allie, because they had like the big led screen behind me. I had the Britney Spears microphone. Like I I was like, man, I look so legit up there. It's crazy, (laughs) but, um, it definitely really helped me establish, establish that platform. And, um, I, I love, love, love speaking. Um, my favorite thing though, is definitely the conversations I have before and after, um, when I'm off stage with people, like I just, I feed off of people. I love getting to hear people's stories and their hearts and what resonates with them and getting to travel across the country. Doing that is just, it feels like the greatest gift. And it's something that I'm most excited about right now with my career. And the cool thing about it is, you know, I get to speak at women's conferences like rise, which is Mm -hmm. all types of people from all around the world, all walks of life. And I love that, but I also have this kind of niche, you know, where I can work with women in ag. I speak at a lot of women in ag organizations, young farmers and ranchers organizations, and to be able to take the lessons I've learned to really uplift the women from my own community also just feels like the coolest gift. Yeah, no. And I think because of your diverse and unique story, I think that's such a cool thing because it allows you to relate to people across a wide variety, whether you're talking about agriculture or not, you have that also, right? So it's um, even furthering the story of ag a little bit. Yeah, totally. And then I want to talk about your latest adventure with Court. I want to know, I mean, when you guys launched it, I was like, oh my God, it's like they have heard the conversations I've had with myself of like, someone needs to do this. Someone needs to take it on the, like, we need a Netflix show. Like Ag needs a Netflix show or something. And you guys basically production crewed it yourself, right? And went through California and just were talking to people about agriculture and their story. So tell me what that was like. Yeah. Okay. So this is how the Backroad Cowgirls project started. It was fairly spontaneous because that's how we roll around here. (laughs) Um, So I was actually speaking at a women's conference in Kansas. And on my way back to California, um, I had a seven hour layover in Dallas. So Courtney Dehoff, she's based out of Dallas and she messages me on Instagram, like, oh my gosh, let me come pick you up. And so you don't have to sit at the airport. Thank heavens. She saved me. So she picks me up and we got to lunch that day. And Um, we're eating pasta, drinking our wine, having a grand old time. And we're just talking heart to heart about, you know, feeling a little burnt out with social media and our business and like feeling like we are feeling uninspired. Like we feel like we're in a funk. We just want to do something different. We, we talked about, you know, our dreams for the future and what we love to do. Both of us love to travel. And I told Courtney, I'm like, yeah, you know, I've been trying to convince my husband that we should do camper van life. Like that's just an experience I want to have. I want to travel the country in a camper van, but my husband is not about that idea. He loves his long, hot showers. He doesn't feel like a very qualified mechanic when we break down. And so we kind of kiboshed the idea. 
And Courtney said, man, I totally do camper van life with you. And so we kept talking and um, we both talked independently about wanting to have our own TV shows one day. Mm -hmm. You know, Courtney has built this incredible fancy lady cowgirl brand and movement that could totally have a show. And I love the show Queer Eye. It's like one of my favorite shows ever. You know, it's these five guys that go into people's lives and give them basically a life makeover in a week. And it's just so empowering. I always cry in like a very happy way. And I thought, how cool would it be to have like a queer eye show, but for rural people in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so we're both talking about this and we, we look at each other and we think to ourselves, like, wait a second, we both love travel. We love agriculture. We love people. We love storytelling. Um, we both want to have our own show. What if instead of waiting for some producer to discover us, why don't we just not ask for permission and instead just ask for support. Mm -hmm. And what if we just filmed our own TV show? And so I fly back home to California, just so excited. The seven hour layover, Courtney and I dreamed up, drafted out this entire idea. And I get back home and I'm so nervous to tell my husband because he's the realist. And sometimes I expected him to say, Kaya, you don't have time for that. <laughs> and I tell, I tell him the idea and he looks at me and he says, huh, there's worse things on TV. <laughs> And so I told Courtney, she's like, that's it. That's the tagline. We need to put that, put that on the van, whatever van we end up getting. And so I told him, okay, great. Like, I think we're going to do this in like end of April, early May. He says, okay, 2023. That's good. Like give yourselves a year. And I said, no, like next month. And he's like, what on earth are you guys thinking? But Courtney and I thought, you know, if we sit on this idea for a year, life's going to get busy. The excitement's going to fizzle out. Like, let's just jump both feet right in and just make it happen. And so in about a month and a half, we had a van that we found from a girl that followed me on Instagram. Uh, we got generous donations from individuals that followed us on social media that believed in the project, um, a few sponsored companies to hop on board and support us, including a local printing company that um, sponsored all of the magnetic decals and the window graphics for this van that's named Moby. My dad helped me put some horns on the front of it. He's a whole vibe. And we decided to make it happen. And our goal for the show, really the premise of it was we love agriculture. We love travel. We love storytelling. We think that at the end of the day, people connect with people. And I mentioned earlier that my greatest passion is for people. And we wanted to create a show that wasn't just education and trying to tell people this is how food is grown. We wanted it to be about like, these are real humans and their real stories that also happen to be in agriculture. And we really wanted it to show the heart of these individuals. And so we started in California for our first season, pilot season. We didn't have the budget to hire a production crew. Courtney's career was in TV, so she knew enough to be dangerous. Um, and then a friend of mine reached out to me on Instagram like two weeks before the trip and said, hey, like this is a long shot, but do you guys have a photographer for the adventure? And I said, well, no, but we also don't have a budget for it. And so mm -hmm. she said, I don't care about the budget. Like I don't need to get paid. I want to come. And so my friend Shelby Caitlin, who is a photographer, a wedding and lifestyle photographer, hopped on board. And for two weeks, we traveled across the state of California, capturing these stories of real people. And we started teasing out on social media and we're turning it into for this first season, a YouTube series. Mm -hmm. And the first episode, we haven't even announced this yet, but the first episode is going to premiere June 7th. Um, and we have 13 episodes, which let me tell you, Ali, most pilots are one episode, not 13 episodes. We, we were a little ambitious, That's a off, lot maybe of a little footage. bit more than we could chew. That is a lot of footage to have to edit and go through. It is. And like major props to Courtney, because she is having to carry most of that load herself when it comes to all the editing, she's editing all the pieces together. Now is where my job comes in, where I'm putting together all of our website work, all of our email marketing, all of our promotions. Um, so we're really just, we bootstrapped this. We decided, you know what, like, it doesn't have to be fancy to get started. You have to start somewhere. Let's just start where we're at with the tools that we have and the skills that we have and our big picture, long-term visions, you know, we're, we're both dreamers. We love to take this to every state in the country. We'd love to take it internationally. We'd love to really create a show that will connect with mainstream audiences, not just people in agriculture, you know, like RFD TV, great cowboy channel. Great. That's not where we see this being. We want it to be something that is on a Netflix, on a Hulu, on a Magnolia network, on a streaming platform so that we can have real people connect with the real people that happen to also be behind um, the food fiber and fuel that they use in their daily lives.
Yes, I love that. I am a big proponent of we don't do the best job at telling our story in agriculture. And if we keep talking to each other, that's great, but no one else is going to hear our stories. So um, I think that that is the coolest thing ever. I've loved watching the sneak peeks on Instagram. And I think my favorite moment though, might've been you in the shower with the uh, waterfall. (laughs) So I don't know. I hope that makes it into the the pilot season somewhere, Um, but I can't wait to see it come to life. And I'm sure it will go big and go far. We are, well, thank you so much, Allie. We really appreciate it. It's been so cool to see the support that, um, that our ag community has supported or or shared with us. And also just the interest and feedback we've already heard thus far, just in our teasers. And I love that you brought up the shower. So if you have I haven't seen, seen the clip. Um, we are having a lot of fun on this journey too. You know, we decided one of our goals at the top of our little Google doc, when we were planning this out was we are going to have so much fun. And if it's not fun, we have to do something different because we don't want to burn ourselves out from the get go. And so we've had a lot of really great experiences, including staying at the Madonna Inn, which is one of the feature stories you all will hear about. But the room we stayed in happened to have a cave shower. And let's just say I lost my mind, okay? Everyone needs to shower in a waterfall cave because it was a life-changing experience. Um, And we just, we feel so honored for the people that agreed to let us come out and share their stories. And um, we just, I I hope that these stories are gonna resonate with people of all walks of life. And um, yeah, we're just so grateful for all the support and we're so excited to share more. So I'm going to ask a question that is probably going to be a little bit of a spoiler, but is there plans for a, another um, trip in starting to do more filming or is it on the, the, the dock? So yes, yes. We do not officially have a date or a specific location yet for season two, but we do plan to have a season two, you know, right now we're kind of in the process of let's, let's get through the editing right. content of season one, which right. Courtney is working on like a mad woman, um, and then decide where we want to go to from here. We're, we're hoping that season two, we will have a little bit more support, maybe an actual production team so that Courtney can, can actually just be a host with me yeah. instead of having to be the one, the one behind the camera and the one editing it all together. Um, we have big visions for it, but I don't have any other updates for you in terms of when to expect season two or where season two will be, but know that we are dreaming up something really juicy and big behind the scenes. So stay tuned. Well, good. I can't wait to see all that. Um, And Kaya, I just want to say thank you, first of all, for continuing to be a strong voice for women, a strong voice for women in agriculture and just agriculture in general, and in all the other platforms that you are sharing your story and sharing about everything really. Um, I think it's super powerful to see um, women continuing to do that and and taking the the role and doing it for themselves. So thank you. And I'm excited to see what Backroad Cowgirls has in store for the future. And then also just following along with you. So thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. If people want to check out the Backroad Cowgirls adventure, or stay in the loop, you can visit backroadcowgirls.com. There's a place for you to sign up for the email newsletter. That's where we'll release when all of our episodes are out. But coming June 7th, um, you can subscribe to the Backroad Cowgirls YouTube channel. We'll have a new episode released every Tuesday um, for a few months, all 13 episodes. Um, Or you can also follow along the adventure on my social media. I'm coach underscore Kaya or also Courtney's, which is at Court Dehoff. And we'll be sharing a lot more there as well. Well, perfect. You took the words out of my mouth because I was going to ask where people can connect with you. So that's perfect. And like always, that will be in the description and the show notes. Um, And Kaya, keep doing big things. I can't wait to see what else happens for you. Thanks, Allie. You too. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Ag Chicks. Don't forget to follow along on social media at Ag Chicks on Instagram and Facebook. And that every episode has a visual version on YouTube on the Ag Chicks channel.